Right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is James Swanson. I'm here representing the Harlequins Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for another installment of our Quality, Diversity, Inclusion panel discussion series. Today we'll be addressing race and ethnicity in rugby, tackling representation, language and intersectionality. Before I pass over to Nick Heath, who will be our expert moderator today, just want to say thank you to all of our panellists for giving up their time and sharing their stories with us. So um, let's pass over to you, Nick. Thank you very much, James. Yeah, if I could ask our guests to uh, present themselves, uh, pull the curtain back and uh, and activate their cameras, and that would be great. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as James says, um, a huge thanks to uh, to James and the work that the Harlequins Foundation and Harlequins have been doing uh, on this series of webinars on tackling inequality. Um, as he says, my name is Nick Heath. I am a Harlequins Foundation ambassador, also a rugby commentator and journalist. Um, and over the course of the series, really, we've... Uh, uh, well, we've covered all sorts of areas related to equality, diversity and inclusion. We've looked at LGBTQ plus areas, disability in sports, mental health. Um, and this is another really important topic. Um, race and ethnicity in rugby, representation, language and intersectionality. Um, now, with the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death this week, there have been some very powerful and poignant pieces uh, out there to see. Um, if you haven't seen BT Sports short film uh, with the former Harlequins winger Hugo Monnier, then I, uh, I do urge you to go and seek that out. Um, I actually, having watched that piece, was able to, to message Hugo and say, look, my frustration and inability to process inequality and, and hate and this kind of thing drives me to tears sometimes. You know, don't stop the great work you're doing. And, and I guess an inspiring reply, but almost a worrying as well, worrying one as well, was we you know, saying, thank you. So long as there's hate and injustice, I won't stop. Um, it would be nice for people like Hugo and, and no doubt many of you guys on the call to, to feel like it can stop one day. But I guess that's what this is all about. Um, and, uh, and of all the injustices and areas of education that we've been discussing through these webinar conversations, um, I think this is one that I find the most frustrating. Um, in most cases, it's a visible prejudice. It's judging someone, it's excluding someone, it's discounting someone, it's making assumptions about someone um, and all based on the color of their skin. Um, to discuss the themes this evening, we are immensely grateful to a phenomenal panel of guests uh, who have agreed to join us. Uh, thank you one and all. From the Harlequins Playing Department, two recent Women's Six Nations champions and finalists for this year's Allianz Premier 15 season, uh, preparing for that match against Saracens this Sunday at King's Home, it's Shauna Brown and Lani Tuima. You have to do your own round of applause here. Yes, well done, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, continuing the players' theme, it's Harlequins fullback and winger plus chairperson of the Rugby Players Association's Diversity and Inclusion Board. It's Aaron Morris, who's here. Thank you, Aaron, for joining us. And finally, not a pro player, but, uh, well, she's certainly played a bit of hockey, rugby and football at grassroots level, now occupying the role of marketing manager um, at Premiership Rugby. It is Buki Mermeke. Thank you, Buki, for joining us. Um, so uh, feel free to keep yourselves unmuted if you're in a relatively uh, quiet space. You know, you're more than welcome to jump in or, or nod along and and, mm, and ah. Um, for those of you watching, by the way, uh, on the webinar, there is a Q&A function. So if you would like to uh, to get a question in as we go, could be relative to what we're discussing at the time or something more broad, we will do our best to either weave it in as we go uh, or I will come to them at the end, whatever feels most appropriate. So use the Q&A function to get any questions in that you have related to race and ethnicity in rugby, representation, language and intersectionality. Um, I think first of all, I'm going to define intersectionality because I think for a lot of people they may not know the word, may not appreciate what it means. I've only come to really understand it in the last couple of years. Um, it was coined in the USA in 1989 by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw uh, to describe how race, class, gender, other individual ca uh, characteristics intersect with one another and overlap. The Google definition, uh, which I checked before we jumped on, the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual or group, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. We will no doubt come on to intersectionality uh, in a little while. But um, Aaron, if I may, I'd, I'd like to come to you first. Um, thank you for your time tonight, first of all. Um, can you give us an idea what the last year has been like for you, um, obviously post 
uh, the late George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and then leading into your role with the RPA and the, and the Diversity and Inclusion Board. Thank you, Nick. Um, and what a great introduction, first of all. Um, the last year, I think it's, it's hard to sum up in kind of a, a sentence or two. I think it's equally hopeful and <laughs> equally um, saddening. And it's a uh, even in the kind of anniversary this this year, that that piece you talked about with with Oogs, I wasn't really able to watch. I didn't I, I didn't want to watch it because I think it's a bit like um, these issues can be a bit like a scab, and to continually have to remove that scab and feel that pain can be something that's really tricky. And it's something that I know myself and my black friends have have experienced this year to continually have to to um, live through that, discuss it. Um, and put yourself in vulnerable positions can be really difficult but I think it's as difficult as it is it's so important I think um, as much as there is a the majority part to play in this is people who are not negatively impacted by racial discrimination I think there is also uh, a massive place for people like those on this call to speak their truths and um, give personal experiences that can help move this conversation along um, and move it from uh, symbolism, which I think a lot of this year has shown, um, to to an activism and try and instigate real change, um, for both UK and globally. Mm. Well, we're grateful for you uh, for you gently tugging at that scab this evening for us, because I know that these are you know they're, they're, they are really emotional issues, quite rightly. I mean, in terms of your your role and and. And I guess there's an element of representation um, in that in that DNI board. How well equipped do you feel to be sort of representing those in the sport whose whose voices may need amplifying? Yeah, I think it's something that brings me immense pride. I think um, I only last year became Quinn's RPA rep, um, and the the RPA's kind of overarching goal is to um, to make England the best place to play professional rugby, both for men and and women, and within that to not um, to not look at, I, I think the aims of the Diversity and Inclusion Board, which was made this year, fit perfectly within that definition as it tries to shine a light on issues of race and inclusivity beyond race that um, may impact rugby players in England and try and make it a, a place where them underrepresented groups feel seen and, um, and uh, is a group or a panel that, that works for them people. It's something that's really in its, it's, uh, it's like fledgling state. It's like we've only had two or three meetings, but I think already we're, we are having discussions that are necessary and trying to um, instigate change and put pressure on the powers that be, whether that's RFU, PRL, um, to, to create that change and make sure it's, uh, that England is a, a diverse and inclusive rugby environment. Yeah, yeah, well, good stuff. Um, Shauna, representation, I know, is an area you feel strongly about. How how clubs can perhaps make you feel more visible, celebrating your blackness, for example. How do you think rugby fares in its in its understanding of people of colour? Uh, like before we move on to that question, I just want to echo and how relatable Aaron's comments were in terms of mm -hmm. like the scab being ripped off. There's so many, there's a lot of programmes now on TV that talk about black history, that talk about black people, but it seems to be about the struggle um, and there's not enough celebration now. So it, it is good that those programs and films are, are going out there and we are educating people who, who don't know history. I mean, not just black history, but it's sometimes it's just history, but now the next step would be to, to celebrate the positive stories and, and not just sort of look on the downsides, but instead of it, it as it, representation for me is is what it's all about it's it's about showing off our people showing off our different types of people and whether that's race and ethnicity or, or gender or different socio-economic backgrounds like there's a lot of fights we're having within rugby metaphorically in terms of like we're fighting against the you have to be white middle class or posh boy sport like we're fighting against the need to have grass i, I went to a, a secondary school perfectly good secondary school in, in south london and we didn't have grass it's not it wasn't a poor school, it was a good school, we just didn't have grass. So automatically people assume, well, then you can't play rugby. But that's when we look at the variations of tag and of touch and promoting that. But sometimes it could literally just be choosing what pictures you're using. 
so for us you, you look at the stoop and there's pictures of the women all over the place um there's pictures of different women all over the place there's pictures of different men like it's not just about using your one or two superstars it's about using a mixture of everybody and showing off who we have because across Quinns especially being a London club we are one of the more the more diverse clubs but even saying that I mean of our of 40 women across the Harlequins women's setup, there's just myself and Langy. So there's still an issue within that, but it's not about saying, oh, like Harlequins is a bad place. Everyone's so white, all the staff are white. It's more just about encouraging more people. If you have a bigger talent pool to choose from, you have better people, you have better players, you have better staff, you have better setups. It, it just makes things better the more people who want to do it. Yeah, that taps uh, taps into. Uh, I, uh, I've read a book by uh, Matthew Said called uh, "Rebel Ideas: The Power of Diverse Thinking," and it is phenomenal. The various examples he chooses all over the world, um, through the CIA, through Google, through major companies, and and actually how, you know, he talks about the CIA when they were trying to respond to nine eleven and how they saw the video from Osama bin Laden and thought it's just some crackpot in a in a in a cave and that's because all of the people in the CIA at the time were all Harvard and Yale graduates all very white middle class but if they'd had anybody with an Islamic background they would have seen for a, for a, you know for immediately that this was a major representation of the prophet Muhammad this was this was sending a serious message and and it just shows they, they, their belief is you know or, or certainly the book is a great read but it, it does encourage you to understand that actually a whole load of lived experiences and the sharpest people and maybe not always the sharpest people are the blend that you need. So yeah, certainly, certainly there, there are um, plenty of things out there that support that view. Um, I mean, Buki, as, as, as Shauna talks about seeing the players around the stoop, these, these sort of images and, and obviously wanting that to, to show diversity as well. So many of the themes on these webinars have touched on the can't see it, can't be it idiom. Um, how have you found your work in sport? Why do you think perhaps we see lower levels of, of people from diverse backgrounds in sport, both both on and off the pitch, certainly here in the UK? Yeah, I think that that's actually something we discussed um, at length, I think, with the uh, PRL EDI group. Um, I think the levels of uh, people of colour you actually find working in the um, in the organisations behind the scenes are probably even lower than we see on the pitch and again it's that can't see it can't be it kind of thing um, one area that we have definitely wanted to um, improve that representation I think we did a black history month kind of um, uh, content series that touched mainly on the backroom staff the people that you don't see all the time because as you kind of said the if you if you can't see the players you can't be the players but also that trickles down into not knowing that those jobs exist off the pitch in in the finance team in the marketing team in the commercial team all those kinds of things you also don't see those teams representing the communities in which they um, operate in so I think for me that's something that I definitely am very quite passionate about in terms of pushing that forward and um, enhancing the voices of the people working behind the scenes as well. I think there are so many um, fantastic opportunities and roles available and people just might not think that they're available to them. They don't see that the, there is a space for them in those areas and I think once we obviously kind of address the playing side of things and then also move that into the off-pitch side of things as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Well, it's good to know that these, you know, that, that you're in a position to be able to continue these conversations. Um, Langi, I'd, I'd love to, to bring you in. I mean, life began in Fiji for you, uh, for those that don't know, uh, until the age of six when you moved over here. Um, have you maybe looking at a coaching side? Have you, in your journey as a rugby player, have you been been coached by any non-white coaches, for example, in the UK? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be on the panel with, with all of you here. Um, and to answer your question, yes, I have. Um, and, but the first time that happened was up here at Quinn's with, uh, with Mark, who's now with Richmond Ladies. Um, and that's not to say I haven't met any individuals along the way who's helped of colour um, to get me to the position I'm in now. Um, and as you've said, I uh, come from a Fijian background. Rugby is definitely within the DNA. And when you talk about race, class and gender, Fiji, if you go back there, there's no such thing um, because it's there's no class when it comes to that sport. It's our national sport and it's, it's, it's everything to us. So when I'm sat here listening to 
um, just the start of this conversation. I can't wait to hear um, everyone else's journey. But from mine, um, respectively, it's been, it's been as I've said, um, amazing because of rugby. Um, and I think first and foremost, it's looking back as well at the history. Um, obviously, even in Fiji, there's racial racial abuse, but even between our own minority, there's more our minorities within that. So we have our Fijians and then Indo-Fijians. Indo-Fijians being um, individuals who are either, either fully or partially from Indian descendants. And, um, and that became a divide within our political um, history. And I think with that, I didn't even know that up until like a few weeks ago, having a conversation with the parents just to say like, this is where I'm from. This is, this is what it was like. And moving forward, how do we, how do I go about that and relate to, to everyone else here and people of color too? Um, and I think recognizing that, educating myself, and then obviously edu uh, putting an action to it, as you've spoken about earlier, Uga Monye in his video. Um, I think, you know, having um, athletes of that profile has helped take this movement and continue, continue to grow it. Um, and even for myself, someone who's not experienced as much, but obviously, um, aware that it exists um, it's um, it's something that I'm I'm looking to continue to edu educate myself on and um, and also share my story from a from a Polynesian Melanesian background too yeah and, and interesting you talk about the sort of you know the, the minorities within minorities because we often talk you know Pacific Island in generality don't we and and I guess coaching wise Pat Lamb at Bristol Tutai Kethu with with Tonga um there is a there is a thread of visibility from of Pacific Island representation at coaching level I mean do, do you identify with that wider definition or or does does that frustrate you in a way that I know that you know the phrase BAME is now becoming more and more frustrating to people because it is it is you know it, it's too general it's it's not helping the discussion how important um is is visibility of a Pacific Island nature to, to someone like yourself, Langi? Um, obviously, you've spoken about BAME and Pacific Islanders. I see it as a, as a whole. Um, we're all fighting for the same reason, and I don't see any injustice in that. Um, from my part, I've just educated myself in terms of there is um, um, indifferences in between minorities as well, and obviously being aware of that too. However, when it comes to talking about race and ethnicity, I think we're all trying to strive for the same thing. Uh, and I definitely put myself in a category where we're all moving towards um, equality between all of us and educating ourselves on that too, um, mm -hmm. for, for a bigger reason, because the fight that we're fighting is a, a lot bigger than just our small indifferences and appreciating those differences as well. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I mean, Aaron, to, to come back to you, I know that um, that that you've sort of got views on the role of colorism, this element of of or, you know diversity within diversity or, or prejudice within prejudice, depending on which side um, you look at it. And and I mentioned um, there the, the the use of the term BAME um, for those that wouldn't be familiar. Black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, is uh, is where the term uh, has been. It's it's become more of an all-encompassing term to, to perhaps capture a diverse population. So um, I know that there are many that want to see the back of that term um, off the back of that and, and deconstruct perhaps why it doesn't work. Aaron, is, is that about right? Yeah, I'd say that's, that's, that's about right in my kind of personal feelings. I think probably come, come quite far even in my lifetime. I remember as a child, my mum having um, an issue with trying to sign me up to kind of school or a hospital and having to click other as opposed to having a category um, that said mixed black and white Caribbean um, so I suppose BAME's a little bit better than that but yeah I still don't think it's I think it's an unhelpful term I think it's um, lacks the specificity needed for these conversations about race and I think if you look at like this is kind of a, a perfect panel to to discuss this because if you're looking at Langi, who comes from her Fijian background, Buki, who um, is a dark-skinned black woman, and comparatively to me and Shauna, who are mixed race, we all experience um, racial injustice and have different experiences of what it is like to be um, a, an ethnic minority in Britain in 2021. Um, 
the experiences of like speaking for myself, the experiences of me comparatively to some of my dark skinned teammates is, is different. There is colorism within racism. And for the, for us to all be lumped in, in one term, often I feel to, um, to present uh, or misrepresent uh, how diverse a group is and kind of, um, and play with statistics to make things look more, more representative than they are. I just find it, it unhelpful and um, I'm yeah glad out of the, the uh, report that came out recently, which a lot of which I disagree with wholeheartedly, I thought that was potentially one, um, one silver lining within it. Thank mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on the term BAME, um, as we were pointing out, Aaron, I think this group actually shows that even, even with the representation that we've got here, we still don't actually have a full representation across what would have been Bain. So we don't have anyone um, of kind of East Asian descent on this to talk on this point. Um, whether that's um, in terms of play, the player room, I don't know that we have many players from that kind of um, uh, background and then into non-playing staff. I know we have very few. So again, just to lump, us, lump everybody in together underneath that term doesn't work because there are a lot of voices that are still not heard when we utilise the term Bain. Yeah, and, and Buki, actually, to pose a sort of slightly reverse question on this, I mean, we, you, you touch upon, you know, there potentially not being people from from East Asian, South Asian backgrounds that are that are playing rugby. Certainly, if we're looking at this sort of in a rugby uh, landscape, I mean, how much do we to to pose this in a challenging fashion? How much do we need to look at what I could call, for want of a better phrase, a, a natural cultural alignment? Could rugby simply not be attractive to, to, to some ethnic areas and, and, and perhaps not be seen as, as entertainment or, or, or that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. I think this is an area that is, it's actually, it's a really interesting one because I think as rugby, our product is so good, the, our offering is actually very good. We're very good on the pitch and we have this tendency to, think oh you know if we put it in front of someone they will come like look, they will see how good that we are how good our product is however um for example in my own family I, rugby was not a thing like I some I don't even know how I stumbled upon it I was just thinking before this when was the first time I remember rugby like I don't I can't I must have been maybe 18 20 like I don't, it was, there was never any emphasis put on rugby in my household. So for example, Langley, I know you mentioned that, you know, being Fijian, it's in your blood, it's in your DNA. That doesn't come across for a lot of cultures. It's not something that's important. So there is no value placed on rugby within that kind of family structure or that cultural structure. So for some people, it's just not attractive. Like if your parents don't know about it, your family don't know about it, they're not interested unless there is something else pulling you in. Like for example, maybe you are exposed at school and you decide that you love it. You have absolutely no inclination to kind of join that. So it's, again, yeah, it's a very interesting point to decide whether or not some of these groups are underrepresented or whether they are represented to the level that they want to be, mm. whether we, whether they, whether, you know, they enjoy the sports that they currently enjoy and they don't feel the need to input themselves into rugby. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, almost, it's, a, it, it's a topic area that I don't think people are as willing to talk about. Do you get that feeling? Yeah, I, I, I would say so. I think, again, we, we just assume that people would want to be a part of it and and it is a great sport. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love rugby. As soon as I as soon as I was exposed to it, it was it drew me off. I absolutely left all all the other sports I ever played and just continued <laughs> playing and watching rugby and just got completely engulfed. But for a lot of people, it, it's it's just not that. So I think it it could be like for example, like I said, my family are not particularly rugby mad. But down the line, in a few in like in more years to come, if you know if I were to have children and then they would be engulfed in rugby and then it becomes a family tradition where as you um, go through the generations but up until now it's definitely up for discussion mm. sure and i think you, you you wanted to come in yeah well i, I just and, and you know may, feel free to make whatever point you were, you were about to make but i was gonna this this may be what you're gonna say but you know it, it's sort of tapping into that area you were talking about before you know where rugby's traditionally sat you know men's amateur era was 
was doctors and lawyers and services personnel. It's it's maybe still largely the right schools, the right socioeconomic status, the right geographical areas. You know, it, it's it, it's still part of that conversation, isn't it? Whether whether that is changing, I guess. Yeah, so I think there's big differences in the men's and women's game. And this is maybe something Aaron would know more about on the men's side. But for the women's team, you look at the English national team, the majority went to a, a non-fee paying school or, or non-grammar school and a comprehensive, which compared to men, like I don't know the exact numbers, but I can imagine a lot of the boys went to certain schools and that the, the pool of talent is so small because rugby players come from certain rugby schools but then talking about my own experience and off the back of what Buki was saying like I certainly am the same as Buki in terms of not coming from a rugby family at all whatsoever rugby is not something I knew even existed like first rugby experiences was just down the athletic track when when the big rugby boys would come in for a shot put because their PE teacher told them they've got a sports day coming up and, and the big boys for a shot put that's what they do so it's not like it's not something I was ever exposed to. Um, and even now, like a circle of friends and people that I mix with, I'll, I'll say I play rugby and like, oh, like fantastic. Like what are we having for dinner? It's not like, it's not a thing. Like nobody's particularly interested in it. And if they do attempt to be interested, I then have to say, oh, they say, what position do you play? And my next question is always, do you, do you know anything about rugby? Like as in, how do I, how am I going to explain to you yeah. What position up and I literally go you know this this scrum happens and there's like eight on eight at the front and there's people that stand out at the back like I'm the front of that so that's the sort of level that I'm explaining to because people just don't know rugby like so many people don't know rugby and explaining it to people who are from a rugby background they can't get their heads around people not understanding rugby because it's all they've ever known but it's just mm. it's just similar to just thinking outside of, of your own bubble sometimes, like re trying to relate to other people who have had different experiences from you, had have, have had different upbringings from you. Like I only started playing rugby age 25. And, and again, similar to Buki, like completely love it. And now we go up to our local rugby club and I coach on, on a Sunday morning and it's very much a whole family event. Like I have three nephews. One of my nieces come up to play rugby. Like everyone is, it's a whole family event now, a Sunday mm. morning rugby. And I have full confidence that, growing through the generations like our family will become a rugby family but because it started with me or almost accidentally but yeah it's um it, it is a great sport but there's still a lot of work to do and whilst yes we want to show off how great our sport is let's remember that not everybody even knows we exist yeah and uh, i mean we'd be paying you 100 grand a year in in a job if we if you knew the answer to this next question but but what what do you think needs to change how do we reach you, you know, if it wasn't for you playing at Harlequins in England, how would we reach your family and your relatives? How, do, how does rug, how does rugby, you know, cross that divide? And and to touch on, you know, the challenging question that that, that I, I asked Ibuki, is there any any element of well, you're not going to, you're not going to get the buy-in from 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 a certain minority or certain group of people? I think we can accept that there's certain sports that are not going to appeal to certain people just because they, they don't want to play it. Like not everybody likes everything, but the easiest win has to be schools. It has to be state schools. It, it has to be making an effort for coaches going into schools, going into inner city schools. Like there is so much talent in inner city schools that is not being recognized or, or being approached because they don't go to schools exactly like me with grass. So, they think, oh, like we can't even can't even attempt rugby because we don't have grass in our playground. But yeah, for me, the, the easy win ha has to be getting into schools and, and getting around and coaching, and then making it easy for people to come to clubs. Like when I think about growing up, it's not a sob story, but my mum didn't drive anywhere I had to go was public transport, so it had to be somewhere that was accessible. Like how many rugby clubs are at the end of a, a two mile driveway? Like how many rugby clubs have got a bus stop within walking distance? How many rugby clubs have got a train station within walking distance? Like, are we accessible? And like, how, how does our sign look on the outside? Does it look inviting? Does it say like, does it say members only? Just all these kind of things around language and visibility physically on those, like what pictures are used on the outside? Do we look like a welcoming club? Um, that's, yeah, that's kind of my answers. Yeah, well, so good. Though. It's so important to be absolutely spot on, um, Aaron. Yeah, I I think yeah, Sean is like so bang on there, and I agree with so much what, what she said. I think if you look at the men's game, they've got a massive foot up. Uh, Sean talks about how diversity has maybe not made it onto the pitch 
as much in, in the women's game and Langi and her are the only two um, people of colour in, in the women's team. But there was a World Cup final, what, a year ago, two years ago, and the, with the most diverse England team there's ever been. If you're looking at the superstars of the game now, it's it's Maro, it's Sink, it's Marcus Smith. There's so the England team is looking more and more diverse. And I think that will, like everything about you, you can't be what you can't see, that will um, have an impact on, on young black boys and mixed race boys feeling like they can be part of that. But I de definitely agree with Shauna that the next step is to try and um, make it a viable path into rugby through state schools. I was just thinking there, I was thinking of them lads and, um, a lot of them are like my age group and my, my mates, but like Maro had to end up at sixth form at Harrow, Sink at Epsom, uh, Courtney Laws, I think he goes to Northampton School for Boys, Benno ends up at Dulwich, all big private schools with big rugby histories. And that is still the gateway. Looking yeah. at Harlequins under 18s, I saw a team that uh, one of their team sheets and I was just amazed by the out of 23 lads, I think 21, 20 of them went to private schools. And as Central someone who, all of this, yeah, yeah, and as someone, and I, I'm not saying you have, we have to close that door off. That is a rich history, and and them lads should be um, encouraged and and given that gateway to professional rugby. But think of the amount of talent we're missing at schools like mine, which didn't have a rugby team, um, where <laughs> there could be young lads which will t kind of taking them on to the next level. So getting rugby in there, getting coaches in there it's already got the leg up of successful role models in the England team. I think if we can get more state school involvement in rugby and have that as a genuine pathway to, towards the England team, towards professional professional game, it's only mm. going to be for the improvement of the game as a whole. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned schools, you know, quite, quite positively, which, uh, which I, I totally agree with it. And you touched on it coaching there as well. I mean, do we, do we need to push the dial harder in a, in a post Black Lives Matter? This is a, a kind of, you know, one of those conversations I've had with, with plenty of people over the last year that, that don't seem to understand when they say, oh, well, if there, if there was a black coach that was good enough, then we'd have given them the role. It's just like, yes, but are you not acknowledging that maybe 40, 50, 60 years worth of, of racial oppression is the reason those positions weren't offered in the first place? Do we need to actually push the dial harder that if out of the top five best coaches for the role you know, the fourth best one happens to be black or from an ethnic minority that actually for the sake of diversity and the benefit of the game and the injustice there has been in the past, that some people taking a punt and appointing these people in these roles is actually where we need to start moving now. Do you, do you think that that's, that's the, the path we start needing to go down? Yeah, I think everyone in an ideal world wants a meritocracy uh, where people get what they deserve and the best person for the job gets that. But I think you have to have an understanding of history and discrimination and issues faced by ethnic minorities. And the way to reverse that is elements of, uh, I think in America, uh, positive discrimination. In America, they call it affirmative action, don't they? And if you look at, um, I think a case study for this argument is the Rooney rule in um, the NFL, which is mm. shows that a, a black um, coach has to be interviewed whenever a, um, a coaching role um, becomes available in the NFL and the amount of um, visibility and the amount of black coaches who have subsequently got roles and gone on to success within the NFL since the introduction of the Rooney rule is clear to see. I think, um, yeah, I believe that uh, elements of positive discrimination or of affirmative action that, that allow, um, allow young black coaches to have opportunities um, is only going to be for the improvement of the game as a whole because it's, then it shows the next young black player or it shows the next young black coach that there's an opportunity there. Um, I think the fact that I, I, before this, I looked at kind of some representations things and like one of 61 RFU council members are black, and, uh, zero of 14 R, uh, PRR board members are black. And I, and I thought about, I think maybe two or three coaches in the whole of professional men's rugby are black. Um, that's that, that's uh, a real shame in my opinion and I think anything you can do um, within the game to to encourage young black men to um, to put themselves forward is is something that's going to be for the betterment of, of the sport as a whole yeah yeah I couldn't agree more um we talk about you talk about the the affirmative action positive uh, discrimination um 
I noticed something, you know, I work as a broadcaster and commentator and I've been made aware through, through uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and things, the sorts of biases that you may not notice you have and that, you know, I wouldn't believe myself to have to be prejudiced in any way. But is there some bias that I'm completely unconsciously aware of? Am I seeing a black player and saying the word power and speed every time I talk about them? Well, I don't think I was or that I am, but I'm, I certainly feel like I'm going to be a better broadcaster if I'm aware of that and I'm thinking about it. Um, and I noticed, I noticed when um, I was commentating on, a, on, a, um, on the semi-final of the Premier 15s at the weekend, Rachel Lankera Tambua was given the ball on the wing two or three times in a row and she dropped it every single time. And I, I, I think I probably even said it on commentary, or at least I, I, I intimated towards it, well, you wouldn't expect a Fijian on the wing to be dropping a ball like that. And I thought, well, I'm trying to compliment the Fijian heritage here, but I thought, Langi, you know, I'd, 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 I'd throw myself under the bus on this one slightly. But, you know, there's, there's positive reinforcement, but where sort of positive discrimination can be hugely unhelpful as well. If people are saying, well, well, you're from Fiji, you must be good at rugby. It's, it's probably a pressure you could do without. Of course, but I, at the same time, I'm, in my opinion, you're also doing your job. So there's a balance, isn't there, between <laughs> that and, and the performance. I think, aside from that, I think you, you asked Rookie earlier, how do I pronounce your name? And that, for me, is important. As a commentator, asking, you know, how do I pronounce this? How do I, how do I say this? In a respectful manner, as you have, uh, I'm sure, many a times. Um, but that is someone's identity. That's where they're from. That's a lot of history there in itself. And for someone like myself, so I've got a long name, which Sean has helped me to, to appreciate too, because for the, for the most part, you know, when someone says your name, that, that is you, that is everything, everything you have to love and absolutely adore because there's so much to it. But growing mm -hmm. up, because it's so long and sometimes it's difficult to pronounce for some people, it's then like, oh, don't worry, I've been called many other things, just, just call me what you want. Whereas now, as you said, you've mentioned her name beautifully there, and I know with Fijian names, it's long-wounded, and there's so much so much letters and all that stuff, but calling someone by their, na by their name is, is massive, and that in itself is, is an issue as well. But I think, to answer your question, I think, personally, you're just doing your job, and maybe it is, um, it, maybe it is whatever, whatever you've been saying it is, but I think personally, you saying her name is saying it how it is. Sorry, is um, is a massive is a massive step in itself, um, with regards to knocking the ball on or being a powerful Fijian winger and doing that as such. I think um, maybe that's a that's a that's for you and her to have a conversation about. But, um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, I, it would be remiss of me not to uh, ask you to share your full name with us. Oh God, Shona, you want to help? <laughs> Okay, on, I'll, do, I'll do the first two. You do okay. the next one. We'll take it in turns. Done. So, Langi Langi. You go. Vaka Bengu. Bongi Drow. Twima. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, you, you'll have to talk me through that and I'll get it into my, the next time I'm on commentary on Harlequins, <laughs> then, uh, then we'll go for the full, for, particularly yeah. if you score the try. I mean, <laughs> You know how much fun could you have uh, get in, enjoying? You know, for me, it's all about the you know the tasting and, and enjoying the words and the good language and things like that. I mean, you know, language has, has come up a couple of times, and and this is this is obviously a big part of whether it's some of the LGBTQ stuff that we've covered previously, um, but is is also a massive part of uh, of this race and racial racial inequality side. We've we've seen Simi Pam uh, over the weekend, um, you know, having to having to deal with her own. Uh, uh, issues there was um an, another you know pretty horrific social media clip of, of someone drunk giving abuse at a, at a doorman um these things are are not welcome um every time i feel like we're moving to a point where it's improving an episode like that or someone like simi will speak up and talk about the fact that these issues are happening i mean buki from 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 your side of things um for uh, within an organization like like premiership rugby um how important is it to you that that any of these issues are are brought up are talked about are given currency um rather than dealt with in private yeah i think there is huge importance in dealing with any of these kind of things publicly um as we've spoken there's such a long history of the discrimination of the prejudice of uh maltreatment so to then deal with them in private almost implies that it's okay for them to kind of happen there is no public apology there is no public 
denouncing of that kind of behaviour. So from my point of view, it's definitely um, hugely important to deal with them um, in the same way that they they existed in the first place, which is obviously publicly. Mm. I think um, internally, obviously, we um, take these kinds of things super seriously and have a, a number of um, protocols in place to ensure that these kinds of things um, don't happen. And if they do happen, are dealt with appropriately. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think we. There's, it's the kind of thing that can be settled in private because then other people who might hold those views continue to hold those views without seeing that their behaviour that they are exhibiting um, is not welcome. Yeah, well, we've had a question through from uh, from Mindset Sport. Aaron, maybe I'll ask you to comment on this. It says, are some people afraid of language or using incorrect language? If someone does inadvertently, what would you like them to do? And it, I guess this is sort of tapping into someone saying, oh, well, you're maybe as one of the BAME community or, and you know, these sorts of phrases, I, I think these terms regularly update and evolve in their cultural currency. So I guess for some people, they're scared of saying the wrong thing. Yeah, uh, I, I understand that. And I've had some pretty f almost laughable experiences with friends of mine when they're trying to say the right thing and not knowing what to say. And they, they end up describing me as having heritage or something like that. And I'm just yeah. like, um, but uh, from my opinion, like, uh, I can only speak for myself in this, but I'm just ask if you're not sure, just ask a question, just ask. Like, I suppose it's similar if you're talking to, if we're talking about um, pronouns and stuff like that, if you, just ask, just say mm -hmm. like, what, how would you, how do you identify your race or ethnicity? And, and that's, that's a great starting point. Like it shows that you care. It shows that um, you're open to learning. Um, I, I, I've had many people get things wrong with mine like I personally and I think a lot of mixed race people don't like the, the, the words half cast but a lot of that is something that quite a lot of people growing up have called me um, and I'm I get that for some of them it's um, they've just not had that level of education in their lives or they've not had experiences with people of colour in their in their lives that have taught them these things so if you get it wrong once I, i'm i'm always going to like forgive i'll tell them what i prefer to be called but then i suppose if you go on to um to continually not seek to learn and seek to give people the uh, use the right language i think that shows a little bit of ignorance um but uh, yeah like i said i'm understanding of people's um some of the difficulties faced by people or, or worries about choosing the right language so i would always just recommend if you're unsure just just going in with open ears and, and asking questions yeah Bukli, i know you wanted to comment and shauna as well yeah i think on that point it's it's that willingness to learn i think a lot of people can be very um quick to jump to their own defense if they get something wrong and it's that understanding that if if you're being corrected it's not necessarily that someone is telling you that you are a, a wrong and a bad person you're being corrected so that they can help you learn and um, move through um, move forward using the right language and using the right terms but often I think a lot of people can be very very defensive they don't want to come across as racist or anything like that so before they even open their minds to hearing the words you're saying they're defending themselves and trying to kind of move away from what what's been said so I think yeah it's that willingness to learn and then also to be able to um yeah not always get it wrong not continually get it wrong because I think you mentioned there that it would be um uh, sorry Aaron you mentioned that it would be ignorant but I think it would actually be almost disrespectful to continue to use that um I think it would move past that ignorance uh, ignorance stage for me but yeah it's just that w openness to learning and not always jumping to your own defense if someone is correcting you it's it's you know it's a learning pro learning process yeah shauna did you want to add uh pretty much exactly what buki just said actually um it's <laughs> the one side of the coin yeah. you don't know ask in the first place but if you think you know and you say things and someone corrects you then don't like don't get defensive on it and don't make a joke of it as well They're like oh got it wrong again or like they just try and turn it into a joke when you actually it's taken, sometimes it takes a lot for, for, for me to correct someone in a certain way, or like it might be close friends and like, well, oh, this is a bit of an awkward situation. At, at what point do I correct them? Do I take them aside? Do I do it in front of people? So it's sometimes it does take a lot for, for people to correct someone else. So when they do take it 
almost as as a, as a piece of advice and, and as help and not that like I'm not telling you you're a bad person you got it wrong I'm just telling you you got it wrong and here's some suggestions or even I'm just telling you I suggest you've got it wrong because sometimes their defense will be oh like I call all my black mates that okay fine if they're okay with that but I'm telling you I'm not comfortable with that if you want to continue using that term to refer to me like we we can no longer have a conversation mm. about anything so yeah it's just it's the both sides just to asking if you don't know and if you think you do but you get corrected then, then take it as help and, and don't get defensive over it yes be a nice human show some respect I mean, it's a, sort of the base level for so many of it, so much of this isn't it um I, uh, we've got a, we've got another question in um, from Molly, which uh, I may come to in just a second, but uh, I can see we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, if you do have any questions, do get them in to us. Um, one question I want to ask, we've sort of covered a little bit of language and, uh, and, and you know, talked a little bit about the intersectionality of, of where people can come from and, and whether it's schooling or, 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 you know, geographical background, that kind of thing. I wanted to kind of get, get a general feel from each of you as to, as to perhaps where you think rugby sits on the scale of a um, the, the the perfect society, let's say that that we know doesn't really exist anywhere, but but that you know shows ultimate fairness and inclusivity for all. Bearing in mind we've talked about how suitable rugby might be culturally to some cultures or not. Um, where do you feel that rugby is in terms of approaching areas of race inclusivity? Do you feel that that it's it's come a long way. It's got a long way to go. That that there are things that it it's missing or that it that it needs to do. Um, I'd love to kind of come around to to, to each of you and, and get your thoughts on that. Perhaps um, perhaps Buki, I might uh, I might put you on the hot seat first if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's absolutely fine. I think as a sport, I think it, uh, rugby has come a long way, but I think there's a long way still to go. I think personally. Lee and I, I can only speak from from my own from my own personal um kind of feelings I think in terms of how I think race, like race relations and things in this space are handled for me almost um and stick with me on this one almost kind of um mirror how race relations are in the UK whereas if you look at something like football uh where sometimes um, racism and uh, racial discrimination can be very explicit. It's very much like the like the like the American style of um, uh, a kind of race relation. So I think there's a long way to go, and there's a lot to unpack because a lot of the time it can be very subtle. It's very very um, nuanced the way these kind of things influence and come into the rugby sphere. It's the you know the levels of coaches um, at grassroots. I know we spoke about grassroots coaching, and then if like. I have played obviously community rugby and like I said, I've never seen um, a coach of colour. So little bits like that, those are the kinds of things that we can do. So I think there's a long, long way to go for, for us to um, truly be totally uh, diverse and inclusive. But I think as a, as a sport and as a, as a nation, we've definitely come a long way, but there's still more to do. Mm. Langi, I'll, uh, I'll come to you next. You're probably our, uh, our youngest panellist, so you may have a slightly different prism through, through which you look through, but, but how do you find the, the nature of rugby where it approaches race and, and diversity in that area? I think, I think I'd agree with Bookie in terms of the, the sport in itself is growing in terms of the women's game, and, and that's obviously awesome to be a part of currently. Um, but when you look at the likes of um, what Aaron was saying earlier with the Rooney rule and stuff like that, that I didn't know existed um, in other countries. And I know it wouldn't be ideal to compare, but when you do compare it to other nations who are doing very well in terms of that section of it, and you look at where we stand at the moment, that we have a long way to go. Uh, and in 2021 at the moment, that's obviously saddening to say, but you know when we have people as such on this panel, and I know a lot more people, um, helping us move in the right direction in terms of tackling things that a lot of people are, are fighting against. Um, we do have a long way to go and that starts from obviously educating ourselves, educating our own family members if, if needs and, and tackling schools as well to, to help mend something that, that needs mending. Mm -hmm. Shauna? I've seen even a comment in terms of the question and answer come in. John Hart has spoken about language. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing. You've got simple acronyms. For me, they're the bane of my life. Like I spend a lot of my day asking what acronyms mean. And so many people don't know what it means themselves, even though they're using it. And that 
that automatically turns language exclusive and it's like if you don't if you don't know you don't know and you're never gonna know um then when you're looking at specifically rugby like when you're talking about the laws and the rules what does what does turnover mean so i i helped i went to a school brand new bunch of girls to rugby had a coaching session with them and i'm saying i'm score a try and like for me scoring a try is scoring a try you put the ball on the line but I say, once you get to that line, score the try. And so they've got to the line and they've just thrown the ball. I'm like, well, what are you doing? I told you to score a try, but they don't know what that means. So it's just the kind of realising that people outside of, of the rugby world don't necessarily know what you're talking about all the time. And, and so many people will not want to pick you up because nobody wants to be seen to be the person who doesn't know what's going on in their room. So, so everybody will sort of nod along and, and smile. But there is a, as incredible long, like a huge way to go, but the whole country ha has a long way to go. So I think it would be unfair to, to say like it's, it's on rugby or it's just rugby or like, this. none of this is about putting rugby down as a sport. It's all about making the sport better and opening people's eyes to just increase increase the talent pool. Like everything is about increasing the talent pool because the sport is only going to get better. And I think Molly asked for sort of a piece of advice in terms of how to make a club more inclusive. There's you're doing my job, Shawnee. You're doing my job reading all the <laughs> Just, right, carry on <laughs> to say to say one piece of advice it like it almost undermines the whole thing and i know she didn't mean it in a bad way but there is no one piece of advice that one an easy one would be do you have a girl section but then if the answer is yes do you have do you have that all the different age groups in operation like can you get public transport to your rugby club where are you advertising do you have social media what music are you using on your social media so for me i very much notice it and i joke about this with langy when when i put posts up depending on what music i put to my backgrounds it depends who interacts with it so a lot of my black mates if i put a certain type of music on they'll interact with a rugby post they, they have no idea what's going on but they like the song so they'll comment and they'll watch it um but then i'll, I'll change the type of music and i'll get different types of people interacting with it so it's just interesting that the whole picture like what what pictures are you using again what music are you using to advertise something where are you advertising are you appealing to potentially a younger audience on tiktok are you going to an older audience on facebook etc so yeah there is no one piece of advice but it's just having conversations with as many people as possible yeah, I'm hope Buki and every marketing manager of the Premiership clubs have been taking notes there because I mean there's tons in there. They're really, you know, and and the idea I think is it is it right, Sean? I think you may have had a chat with James about even music that's played on match days at clubs and actually who is that targeted at? What are those? What, what are they going to be the influences that 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 has on on whether people feel that it's directed at them or or whether there could be other communities that that kind of thing appeals to? Yeah, yeah, music is is a huge thing, and some people will sort of not realize how much of a how much about sport is about music and music in the gym and like, you're, you want to listen to a certain type of music and I, I'm very used to living in a world where, where pop is is exactly that it's pop it's popular music but I don't listen to that so when it comes on in the gym I'm just kind of like oh this is not for me like I'll just carry on in the corner on my squat rack happy and then like my type of music comes on I'm like whoa this is it's almost like appreciated and I know nobody else in the gym wants to listen to it but that when they put an effort in to have a little dance to it as well it kind of makes you feel a bit at home and, and like that welcome and that sense of belonging because I know most of these girls will not listen to this music at home but they've made the active effort to put this on like to make me feel at home so yeah it's, again music on match days all of that sort of stuff like why why do we play pop why can't we mix it up why can't we have a bit of bangra like have a bit of reggae just mix it up because because why not yeah no, it's great. Really, really, really important points. Um, just to cover those questions that Shauna mentioned. So John was asking, do you think problems with language and inclusivity tend to be mainly generational? Well, I think, as, as Shauna eloquently said, it's so often about just the words and language that are being used by people on a daily basis that can exclude others. Um, so I don't think it is, is mainly generational in that sense, although I appreciate, John, the, probably the point you're making. Um, and Molly was asking, um, she said, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask from a grassroots club perspective, what would be a bit of advice you would give to make rugby clubs a more inclusive space if anyone has anything they'd like to, to jump in on that then let us know um and uh yeah aaron i think you know the the overarching question i asked to begin with was um or, or, or this sort of last section is uh is where you view rugby is at and and i guess the work you're doing on the on the board with the rpa is all part of this but um but what are your feelings at the minute i think i'll probably echo quite a lot of what's been said already in terms of um it's come far, but it's got a long way to go. I think um, 
prior to um, potentially ironically with a year where a lot of people would uh, determine uh, the conversations and the broadening conversation around racial injustice has led to progress. I think this year probably for me has been illuminating in, in more in the sense of how far there is to go. I think um, I potentially rugby likes to paint itself as uh, the sport for all sizes and incredibly inclusive. And I think in some senses it can be. But having said that, I think around race, there is so far to go. I think of certain things this year. I remember England Rugby putting a, a Twitter post up of um, the, the men's team kneeling and a very simple message around um, how the, the men's team were kneeling against racial injustice. And the com I, I honestly believe it would probably be one of the most engaged with um, social media posts of the year for England Rugby. And the comments were from all uh, corners of, of England and England rugby fans were so critical and so and disparaging and feeling like they couldn't support this team for, for clearly, in my opinion, standing for a very simple message. Um, so I think that moments like that illustrate how far there is to go. Um, I think a lot of what's been said today is uh, the steps that need to be taken to improve it, um, to make it more inclusive. And I think uh, a couple of the things specifically around conversations like Sean has spoke about and around education, they're the kind of um, key pillars with which this, um, the improvements can be built on. Um, but yeah, a long way to go, but as a, someone who's like a stakeholder and someone who wants to be a part of it, being on, on that board and just being a, a mixed race player in England, I'm, I'm up for the fight. And I think there's a lot of people, um, both people of colour and um, importantly, other people who are as keen to see this change uh, as, as I am. And I suppose the more the better and the more people like who, who join things like this today, um, that's baby steps to, on the right direction. Yeah, we've just got a couple of minutes left. I mean, it's, I'll, I'll just uh, cover a couple more questions very quickly. But yeah, absolutely spot on. And um, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, I do a lot of work in the women's game and I happen to, to read a, a link to an article on the Telegraph website. And for the first time ever, I decided to read below the line in the comments. It was the most depressing half hour I've ever spent in my life. But I just get, I think at some point you have to go, OK, there are people who are on this journey that are going to move things forward. And there are people that we're never going to convince. And, and I don't know whether that's a healthier state of mind to be in um, or whether we want to work harder at trying to trying to get to those people. But I certainly empathise with with you on seeing those sorts of comments. Um, I mean, partly on, on that top, topic almost. I mean, um, it's an anonymous comment but it, uh, or question, but uh, I think this is on the subject of allyship ultimately. Does it frustrate you that the people leading the change within institutions tend to be people of colour? How do we encourage white people and, uh, and others, I guess, to realise uh, that there is a problem and get them to engage in the need for change? Um, would anyone like to, to, to jump in on that? Yeah, I can start on that. I think it's a really difficult um, topic actually. I think there are a lot of white people who acknowledge that there is a problem and that change needs to occur but as Aaron was just saying um, with that post on Twitter and you see the pe see the amount of people who don't think there's an issue. So what yeah to, to actually answer that I'm not I don't think I have an answer but I think that there are a lot of it is frustrating, yeah. It, it is frustrating, I think, that a lot of this is driven from the inside and you do need the people on the outside to actually facilitate some of this change. Um, I think things like this are part of the solution, a part of um, helping to educate people that there are that there are still issues. Like, for example, I, I obviously, even in taking um, my role, like the way that you have to think as a black person, it was... It, it seems ridiculous now because I've, obviously I've, I've got the job and everybody within the organisation is absolutely fan, uh, wonderful. But my first thought was, have, has, a, has a black person ever worked there? Have they ever worked with anybody black? Will I be the only black person? That, those are the kinds of things that you think about. And although that's not necessarily, that's not a sob story, then that's not at all saying that uh, anybody is racist, anything like that. It's just the thought well, process. The reality and a lived experience. Uh, yeah, it? exactly. As a black person. So even that for me shows that there is a problem if people from different um, backgrounds have to still think like that. Mm -hmm. How we actually solve it. Yeah, I think little, little baby steps as we're kind of doing here and just 
involving as many people in the conversation because it's not a thing that we can just push and say this is a problem fix it they need we need to bring people along the journey with us in order for them to fully understand um what's happening and what they can do to help improve it yeah go on Aaron yeah I I, I echo what Vicky said but I, I will directly say it is frustrating yeah um I, I've chatted to when me and Shauna did an event and we talked about this and I just really want to kind of live in a world where it's people who it doesn't have to be people who are negatively impacted by discrimination continually bringing these conversations to light um I look at my life and I'm not saying that I'm some shining beacon of light on, on all these things but I look at how I see as a as a son and a brother and and a partner how I look at um like sexism and the patriarchy and the gender pay gap and how I want to ensure everything and no, that nothing I do in my life um, contributes towards that discrimination that women feel and I would just would hope that people who aren't negatively impacted by racial discrimination would take that similar position and try and do everything they can to to educate themselves and and impact their bubbles because if enough enough people impact are talking to their parents and their friends then before you know it there's there's national change there's global change so yeah um, yeah it is frustrating but the more and more of these things and the more people who do the the better things go yeah well we're going to round things off there is a question from kathy i don't know one or two you may have a role model in mind um certainly all four of you have uh, have been brilliant this evening and uh, and will be role models for others i'm sure um kathy says as an lgbt fan i know that nigel owens and gareth thomas coming out were massive for me as i saw someone i could relate to in rugby um i know it's not exactly the same but who for you was maybe a person who was that role model you may not have had one but if you did um feel free to uh, to jump in and, and share it with us for me, the, I didn't look up to sort of anyone as an idol or role model growing up. It was all about my mum. Like she was the one who enabled me. She was the one who like made me go out and play or I, I'd never had to fight over wearing a dress because we're going to a party, you need to put a pretty little dress on. And that's what girls do. Like I never had to have that conversation with her. It was very much a, we're going to a party. What do you want to wear? Is it even a real question? Here's a tracksuit. Uh, at least like work with me and have some baggy jeans like, okay I'll have baggy jeans but I'm gonna wear trainers one because I've got to be able to run around so yeah like role model for me like I can't say it's because I didn't see anybody that looked like me I, I don't know why I didn't but it was always and has always and is still now always is about my mum and like her looking after me even at the age of 31 very much still looks after me <laughs> yeah my mum who, who is white by the way and, and some people re it really confuses some people when I turn up with a, a white mum because they can't get their head around that. But yeah, it's um, for me, my role model is my mum. I'm glad someone's looking after you, Shauna, that's good. Um, Buki, you're, un you're unmuted. Did you want to jump in? Uh, I wasn't gonna jump in, but- Okay, I'm that's fine. That. <laughs> that's all, all good, all good. Um, if, if anyone else did want to speak, then uh, then let me know. But Aaron, were you, were you keen? Yeah, my, mine was Jason Robinson. I think um, to be, what, uh, eight years old, 2003 World Cup, just kind of getting into rugby to see someone who looked a bit like you just being the absolute one of the best players in the world and um, kind of that stuff we talked about about representation it, it gave me something uh, someone to aspire to and someone um, it showed me that it was possible and now 26 knowing that I can never ever be as good as he was but I still say he's my I still say he's my role model there's still time Aaron there's still time um you have all spoken brilliantly on uh, on what is the tough topic and look as we touched on at the start it is uh, it is tough to keep talking about so we're hugely grateful for your honesty your candor um and uh, and uh, you know your your opportunist your opportunity to to be here with us so thank you um John has said thank you all so much for taking the time to share your views and influence the way we should be thinking Thinking. Hillary says this has been really good thank you so much I'd also like to see a more diverse crowd at the stoop and at other grounds I am in to help change we like that Hillary uh, Jane has said thank you all really insightful and so nicely discussed Claire says thank you all for your candor um, and uh, and Mark who is our head boy at the Quinns Foundation uh, said I wanted to thank you so much for a fantastic event really insightful contributions grateful for your time energy and commitment to help us provide a platform to discuss this topic and improve our knowledge and approach moving forward a so big thanks from all of us at the 
foundation. Um, so, uh, yes, as, uh, as I round things off, um, you can applaud yourselves again. You did such a good job at the start. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this evening. Thank you for spending your, uh, your Wednesday evening with uh, Buki Moameke, to, uh, to Langi Tuima, to Aaron Morris, and to Shauna Brown. Um, thank you very much indeed, James. Uh, we uh, we got there with the reboot. I think we all stayed here. It was all right. We did. That was a very uh, heart wrenching moment. We got back. Thank you for everyone in our perseverance. Thank we didn't lose anyone, and uh, thank you to all our panelists for being able to carry on. Um, just to echo what you said, Nick. Um, thank you so much on behalf of the Harlequins Foundation to yourself, Nick, but also our panelists for sharing really, really valuable insights for such an important conversation. So we really do appreciate your time. Um, just to say thank you to our audience as well. And uh, we have one more event coming up in June on trans athlete inclusion. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, all the best to Shauna and Aggie for this Sunday. And we will see you all um, at another event soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks all. Nice spending the evening with you. Take care.